the man who needs no introduction, Anthony the Man Mundine, joins a podcast to open up and delve deep into the mindset behind the man who did it all. 28 knockouts, 3 world titles, speed, athleticism, power, endurance, professionalism, the man resurrected Australian boxer from the dead. And if you thought that's all he was able to do, think again. The man did it all on the rugby league field with his razzle-dazzle and freakish athletic ability. Look at him go. Turning something into nothing. Look at Mundine. Look at his athleticism. Charisma. Charm. Captivating. Look at Chop go in space. It was something to see, and the fans were behind him, chock full of magic, indeed, tuning in guys, must last And the next guest on the podcast, does he need any introduction, Australia's greatest athlete, multiple time world champion, I'll bring you Anthony the Man Mundine, Assalamu alaikum my brother. Assalamu alaikum my brother. Assalamu alaikum assalam, how's things, Anthony, how's times man, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, t- uh, tough times, bro, you know what I mean? But alhamdulillah, man. I never fear, man, because, you know, at the end of the day, God is um, in control of everything. And um, you know, I always make that every time I do my salah. Um, you know, he's in, he's in control, so alhamdulillah, man. Wow. I'm doing good. I'm just trained, stay, stay busy and you know, stay in shape. Hey, that's the main thing, man. Talking about tough times, tough people, you know, Adversity is something that you faced your whole life. Talk to us as a youngster coming through the ranks, you know, what sort of challenges were you facing to make all these rep teams, to discipline yourself in all these sports? Because like I introduced you, you know, basketball, athletics, rugby league, whatever it was, you put yourself to it. Talk to us a bit about that, the struggles and how you overcome those as a youngster. Yeah, um, yeah. obviously I knew from a young age I had, uh, had a fair bit of talent in sport. Um, and I, you know, it was my passion. Obviously, at, at the time when I was, I started playing rugby league when I was four years old. Um, you know, so I played with Zetland, Zetland Juniors. I was in, in Waterloo, in the South Sydney comp. Um, yeah, it was called Zetland, Zetland Juniors, and uh, played from you know, I think it was Angre Eng back in the day. Then obviously went up, went up. Uh, played with Zetland for a while. Um, was in the South Camp for a bit, and then uh, I come. I went to uh, Cowrie Juniors, which is down near Glebe, the Cowrie Hotel. I played for the, the Cowrie side. Then I went to um, come over to the St George Comp um, district when I was about probably thirteen, about about fourteen, fifteen. Started playing around locally around here with Hurstville United. Um, I had one season with the Elwood Saints. Um, yeah, so I've been been around. Then you know, went and played for Newtown, just following my team, my mates, and try having fun. You know what I mean? Just wanting to, you know, just just compete, really. No, hundred percent, and compete you did. And something I loved about you, and what was unique, is you kept that same energy. You know, when we're all mucking around with our cousins and our mates in the park, we're telling them we're the best, we're the man. You went on to continue to do that through the ranks. Where did that self-belief come from? Because a lot of the youth watching, they struggle with that confidence because doubt and fear is always instilled in them. How did you channel that and then keep that energy as you climb the ranks? Yeah, I was a very confident sort of on the borderline of cocky sort of, you know, when you're out with your, your mates, especially, you know, um, I, listened, I grew up with the Lebanese brothers and, and you know, the, my Aboriginal family and that. And, um, you know, we'd always talk smack to, smack to each other. So, I don't know, man, you know, it's always, you know, outdo, outdo your sort of brother, you know what I mean? And that was, that was, that was, that was a healthy competition at the time, you know, making rep teams, um, you know, see, so see, so can be sort of the, the, you know, the main, the main actor, you know what I mean? Out of, out of, the, out of your crew. So that really pushed me along. But the way I channeled it, bro, I just, really feel mental is is the main the main aspect mentally and making the right choices in life you know what i mean 
I never drank. I never smoked. I never took drugs. I had one purpose and one goal in my mind, and that was to make make NRL, ARL back in the day, ARL, which is the NRL today, and to make an ARL. And um, I wanted to be in the in the in the lights, sort of camera action, you know, with the, with the footy. So that was my main my main goal at the time. No, hey, God bless you, man. So you go on and continue to make the school boys. You know, you're playing at the highest level for your time, and with that, I, I couldn't but but know there would have been a lot of temptation. You know, like you said, as the party years come, the drink is there, the partying is there. Your discipline was to ensure that you never fell into those traps. How yeah, hard man, is that, man? Because all these athletes, they get to levels and they fall off straight away. Yeah, man, I'll tell you a story. My dad, my dad from a young age, embedded in me um, the, 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 the dangerous sort of side of, of life. And that was, you know, obviously drugs, alcohol, alcoholism um, and drugs are the main two sort of sort of paths that you can you know if you make that choice it'll take you down a fucking dead end, dead end street you know what I mean so my dad from a young age about 9, 10 years old um, back in the day you know when King's Cross was pretty bad with, with um, crack addicts and drug addicts and you know all types of people down there and um, he, he used to go with the cap, cop, copy shop, uh, Barcaluzzi. He still goes there today, um, back in the day. And then we used to go for a walk down the back of um, King's Cross. And um, we used to engage, engage with the, with the homeless and with the drug addicts and with the, with the people that you think, you know, people look at as worthless in society. But from, you know, them people gave me the, the, the best lessons in life. Because we didn't just engage, you know, stop and engage with them, but we had great conversation. And he used to, they used to tell me, don't ever take drugs, don't ever do this, you don't want to end up like me. And this, you know, my dad, you know, exploited that to me, you know what I mean? At a, at a very young age. So from that moment, I, I knew that I was never going to take drugs and I was never going to drink, no matter what. And, you know, uh, to reach my goals and what I wanted to achieve in becoming a first grade NRL, uh, ARL star at the time and, and, you know, to go as, as far as I could, I couldn't, I couldn't let temptation, um, you know, differ me from that, you know? No, 100% subhanAllah. And especially as Muslims, we look at the seerah of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and he used to break bread with the slaves and with the lower class. It was never a class system. He came to abolish that. And, you know, you see interactions where, he went down from the minbar when he was preaching to shake the hands of the people who felt like they were not connected in the community to give them that we're all one, no matter what walk of life you are, it's a brotherhood. Yeah. And it's it's, it's yeah, crazy. It's crazy that your father That's instilled that. Man. Yeah, he instilled it from a young age, bro. And, you know, I remember you know, when I was 14, um, I was hanging out with all the brothers and that in Redfern. Went to a house. It was about six, seven, eight, Brothers in there, and I was, I was having a smoko session, you know, um, a, a bong session, and um, with Yandy and uh, puff up, uh, puff puff giving back in the day, you know, when that puff puff give was sort of a thing, and then um, it's sort of around to me, it's a chocolate you want to hit, you know, and I fucking I froze, bro, for about it felt like a minute, but it was about probably about set ten seconds. And I come out of that and I, and I, I said, nah, bro, it's not for me, man. It's not for me. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. I'll approve. I cut. But I walked up over this hill. And when I got to the top of the hill, I broke down in tears. I couldn't, you know, when you you can't stop crying. Yeah. I'm still hysterically crying. And I, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And when I did, eventually stopped, I knew from that moment that whatever I wanted to achieve and, and become reality through hard work and you know dedication i knew i was going to achieve it and you know because any um sort of you know peer pressure stuff was never gonna make me do something that i didn't want to do yeah no god bless you man and seeing these testing times when times of covid and times of restrictions the youth i couldn't imagine the temptations that be you know having now all the, uh, the urges and the craves. So reflecting on your success and what that discipline got you to, 
is something that they need to channel and understand that tough times are made for tough people and great things are waiting. Yeah, man. Well, especially everyone that's probably listening to this is probably mainly uh, Muslim brothers and and that you understand, man. At the end of the day, the, the agenda, what they're trying to push now, they can plan all they want, you know what I mean? But uh, obviously, the, as a Muslim, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest of planners, you know, and so everything's going to be all right. It's just going to, you know, you gotta have a bit of patience and, and, and just, um, you know, stay strong. No, 100%. And stay strong, you did. So after that moment you had, you, you promised yourself you're going to get there and do what it takes. You start to make the rep teams. Talk to us about that and your progression into the ARL because, boy, did you make a storm when you got there. <laughs> yeah, alhamdulillah, man. I, I sort of made all the rep teams when I was young. I was a very talented kid, you know, with a lot of talent, a lot of, you know, rare talent. But, you know, speed, you know, good footwork. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the best defender, but I, I was good enough to, to, um, to do, do good. So then, you know, I made the Australian schoolboys, you know what I mean? From there, um, I went straight into, from the, from Jersey Fleck, back in the day was under-19s under and not under-20s. It's under nineteen back then. So I was on his first year, Jersey Fleck, first year, so I was about 17. And then when I I went I went back to, to St. George and they put me straight from Jersey Fleck after the season that season, because it was a short season, 10, 10 weeks, whatever. After that season, they put me straight from Jersey Fleck. And back in the day, if you remember, it was um back in the day it was twenty under twenty ones, reserve grade first grade. That's how it was. I had the brother and Mark Guy on. He he debuted yeah. in all of them. He played in one 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 one, and that's when he made his first great debut. Oh, the same good. day he played them yeah. all. Hello. Yeah, well, I that, I skipped um skipped the twenty ones. They put me straight in the reserve grade from yeah at five eight. So uh, Brian Smith obviously saw that I had the potential to become a creative player as well as a finisher, and um so I did debut in, in reserve grade um. At uh, five, eight, uh, seventeen, you know, it was pretty, pretty crazy. And, and talk to us about that—that that pressure. Now, a lot of people don't understand when you're making it and success comes. A lot of people follow, man, and a lot of bandwagon has come. How was it back then? Was everyone wanting a PCR? And you know, how was it? I couldn't imagine. Oh yeah, definitely, man. Like, especially you know when you hit the scene on the, on the, on the you know, ARL or NRL sort of circuit and people are talking about it, the hype, is, is it real? They want to see, they want to know how people come out to watch you and, and to see how, you, how you're doing. But, I, you know, I sort of, I love that, man. I love that pressure. Like, I, I sort of thrived under the pressure. Yeah, man. It's, it's not for everyone, man, but it's, it's championship level there. Because even now, it's, these days, you see like your Sam Walkers and the youngsters that are coming through, they almost protect them as much as they can to not make them in the spotlight or not put them out there too quick, too fast because they sort of drop off. But you were put there at 17 yeah. and you just kept leveling up, 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 and up you go. Yeah, I think, yeah, some people are just just born to deal with it and have a have a resilience to any type of thing, any type of pressure, whatever. And I, I love that pressure. That's why when I was 20 years old, bro, when I was 20, I was killing it. In I started. I played first grade. And I was killing it, and um, I was killing it. And then, um, you know, I wasn't getting sort of. I was getting attention, but not obviously as a junior. I was getting the, the attention, um, a lot of attention. But then, I hit the, the first grade. I was getting attention, obviously because my dad and whatnot. But I felt like I was the best already. You know, what I mean, I was just a confident, cocky cat, and. Um, you know, I said my, my, my first statement I said, um, out, we'll say our landly state statement. And this guy, this guy was only 26 at the time. I was 20, so I just turned 20. But I thought like I was a new kid on the block. You know, but I want to try and take these big cats on. And that, I said, this, this guy's run, run, running old legs. And it was Laurie Daly. And it was just 26. And I'm like, my dad, and then went, I hit the media. And my dad, ring me, what are you doing, mate? You can't be disrespected, Lord. I said, bro, what do you mean to be disrespected? I don't want to take him on. What do you mean disrespect? I'm, I'm ready to go, you know what I mean? You guys take that back. I said, I'm not taking it back. I ain't taking it back. I want, I want, let him see me on the field. 
I saw my mentality. It was like a fighter's mentality from, from back then. A hundred percent, man. And look, you got to have to have that certain confidence, that mindset to be to reach the levels and the heights that you've reached. It's all, it's all, it's all about the mindset, bro. It's all about the mindset. I have a, I have, I have a, actually, I've got a, um, um, like a workshop that is called Mundane Mindset. If you go to mundanemindset.com, you'll get the information, but it actually does, you know, do workshops on how to, to impl- implement this, you know? No, 100%, man. It's very important because a lot of people, like even when I have guests on and I say certain things, they're calling me take it back as well. I'm like, bro, I'm not going to take it back. I said <laughs> what I said. I keep that same energy. Like if you have me off camera, on camera, I'm the same bloke. I'm not going to change for anyone. Exactly. Yeah. It's same with me, bro. I'm just, I just keep shit real. You know, I'm not, I don't, there's no sort of gray area. I'm just black or white, bro. And that's it, man. I speak no, the truth. 100%, man. And something like I've had guests, you know, all guests of life, you know, I've had Buzz Rothfield on the podcast. And something that bothers me is the Latrell Mitchell incident that's happening, you know, in the last couple of, this week, you know, he's been given six weeks, he's missing yeah. out on the semi-final. A lot of people commenting, don't understand. I don't know. Yeah, sorry, what were you going to say? I don't know why Latrell didn't fight it, man. I don't, don't know why they didn't fight it. Because of the carryover points, bro. He was not going to beat the system, and they're going to give him more. He was never going to get less. The minimum he was looking at, four weeks. But, but at the end of the day, like, what's he got to lose? You know what I mean? He's going to miss a few games next year on the carryover, or he can may have a chance to play this year. Yeah, but you know Wayne better than anyone. He wants to protect more so Latrell from all the scrutiny he's going to get. Because yeah. the media are um, going to throw the book at him, bro. They've already done it and he hasn't said anything. Yeah. Yeah, I feel... I mean, Latrell is obviously an unbelievable talent, but he's... um, That's the way he plays footy. He's a very aggressive player not just not just in this game in every game i've seen the brother play in aboriginal knockouts and he's the same fella he's like he's that guy that that, that players love to hate you know and the troll stand up for himself he, he's very aggressive and that's his style of play so i don't think he's intentionally meant to to hurt manu um but unfortunately they just I just um was in the in the sorry sorry bro. No no all was good. in the um it, it goes back to what I was saying on the mindset in bro. The wrong, wrong position. And for me, what I was the point I was making was mindset, bro. You got to be that champion, to be that sort of competitor that Latrell is. He got he competes on everything, he puts a hundred percent on everything. And the game's not played in slow motion. What do you want him to do? Manu stepping yeah. in on the left yeah. side, he's going to offload, where, just expose his cheek. Yeah, no, what else would you what would you do? You know what I mean? And Manu felt like 30, 40 centimetres the last sort of second. You know what I mean? So it was hard to... He was already committed to the tackle. And coming at that speed, he couldn't stop. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. 100%, I feel, man. For, the, I feel for the better. Yeah, same. same. But look, it is what it is. At the end of the day, I'm sure we come back bigger and stronger. You know, Trent Robinson, yeah. after the game, said, you know, it's something he needs to take out of his game. Then you look at Victor Radley and Warrior Hargrove's done the same thing and he's, he went to bat for him. <laughs> You know, it's a funny game, this thing, man. Well, well, obviously, uh, I mean, if Latrell were playing for Roosters, it'd be you know, probably a different story. Yeah, no, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. So you go on, you know, you said that you back yourself against Daly, you back yourself against Fitler, you back yourself against the Johns. Talk to us about that mindset, because you were hungry, you were leading all the stats, you were yeah. doing everything, you're making noise. That mi- you- the main mind, the mindset, bro. I just wonder. I wonder, to be honest, I wonder. My goal was to to represent my country. And represent on the senior level, so I've represented every level that you can imagine from the juniors and the and the schoolboy level, you know, transgrand schoolboys, all the rep teams, all the state teams, all the um, even in the seniors. I played the state teams. I played um, city teams, city country. Um, I just want to. I just want to have that notch in my belt to 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 say I played for Australia. You know what I mean? So that's why I was calling these good, these cats out. Uh, the Fitlers, the Dailies, the Johns. I call him out. You know, I told Fitler, why pick him when I whip him? You know what I mean? This is this is like a big... And this is before the game. So he knew it was on. So when, 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 we, when we play, um, you know, when like a 5'8 or, or, or a fullback would catch the ball and pass to the front rower. But if I was on the same side, that, 
if they want, they catch the ball. If I was on the same side, they would catch the ball and just look at me and try to run straight up and try to intimidate. And I'd punt, I'd tackle and say, "All day, brother. I'm here all day. You know, I'm going nowhere." You know, I mean, I'd, I'd get in their head. You know, what I mean, so I wanted to get you in their head before the game, during the game, and after the game. And alhamdulillah, like like Khabib said, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, they never beat me. They never beat me. They never beat me. Their team never beat my team. In the five, in the six years that I played probably, uh, in a row. Yeah, bro. Now, God bless you. Look, the stats speak for themselves, man. And and and, 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 and they never and and, and, they, and they never played me. I ever played. I ever played just as good as them or way better than them. Nah, God bless you, man. Listen, the the stats and the history books say it for themselves, man. I introduced you as Australia's best athlete. I'm gonna send you a post oh. that I put in 2014. You know, you came in. But what people don't understand is. To do it in multiple sports at the highest of levels, you were playing basketball and touring at 15. From the basketball players right. I spoke to, they told me they couldn't compete with you and you're, you're in your 40s, bro. Yeah, I'm not, I play, I love basketball growing up. You know, I mean, that was one of my, one of my sanctuaries as a, as a kid. But I, I never had that passion. I loved it so much, but I never had that passion as, as much as football or boxing. You know what I mean? And but I was I was a gun, you know what I mean? I was the gun. I played. I pl I tell you a story. Um, Rod, he, he was my teacher. I went to Glebe High School for one year, Glebe in Glebe. And Rob Murphy was our basketball coach, and he was a he was a state coach. He was the um, the state coach for. He was a state coach for the for the state team, a um, rep rep team. Now I never played, I never I never tried out for reps, but he knew what I could do. You know what I mean? They had an injury, they had an injury in, in their um in their team, and I wasn't even playing reps. And they needed a player to come in. He rang me and said, "Chuck, would you want to would you play in the the state championships?" So what do you mean? Yeah, the state championships are on down at Albury. Uh, next, uh, this is tomorrow. I'll uh, uh, probably a couple of days away. And can you come down? We'll fly you down, whatever. He said, yeah, I'll play. So I wasn't even playing reps. And then they flew me from, from Sydney to Albury to compete in the state championships as a basketball player. <laughs> no. I couldn't believe it. Man, the resume you've got, man. So you've always contested, contested and competed at the highest of levels. And, you know, a lot of us do it at the park and a lot of us think, you know, we can play all these sports, myself included. But it's a different level yeah. what you've done. You rewrote Australian history. I'm telling you, man, it's it's freaking yeah. what you've done and it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you might, alhamdulillah, bro, alhamdulillah. My, my resume, no one's got it. I and mean, it's arguably no one probably will ever have it. You know what I mean? So, alhamdulillah, I've done something that no one, no other person's ever done. Maybe not in not just in Australia, but in the world. You know what I mean? I mean, play, you know, people come over, cross over from sports and whatever, um, but no one's done it like I've done it. You know? No, no uh, one. Has I, I won two. I, I won two world championships, bro. Like, oh, we haven't even got this. The best. We've been about half when an hour left, in. When I left um, footy, I was best playing. I was best player in the world at the time. I could be. Easily the top three, but I will be the best player in the world. So talk to us about that. So now you played Origin, you played at all the levels. The Australian tour comes about. Something doesn't sit well. Tell the people what happened and then your mindset to back yourself and the steps you took afterwards. Well, it's not that it don't sit well, bro. Like, I was the man, bro. Like, if you look at my season in 96, even 99, the finals when we lost in, against Melbourne did that, that two-point game in the final. Um, and that saying that I went into that game, the, the grand final game with the tonsillitis. No one knows that. I, I was in, I was in a, on a on a drip for three days. No one knows that, but that's just another story. Um, but um, what we're we talking about? We're talking about like uh, the grit, the determination. You weren't getting that recognition, and then you said, "Yeah, yeah, finished." So I was um. Yeah, you know, I was killing it. I was the best. And 99, bro, I'm a 5'8", man. I was a 5'8". I was scoring nearly 20 tries a fucking season. You know what I mean? That's unheard of, bro. You know what I mean? Like, 
not 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 just scoring twenty, but I was setting up for thirty, fifty. You know what I mean? It's unheard of statistic. Um, daily, they were taking a tour, a tour to 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 England at the end of ninety nine. They don't take they don't take twenty five players. They don't take thirty five players. They take forty two players, forty two players. So everyone thinks hundred percent mundane's in this in this tour, the Australian tour. They tour England. They take two teams, bro. Two teams, not one, two. So they read up. They read, they read out the, the the players you picked, and um, they read out the players play. And I, I didn't get picked. Sean, I don't know if you remember Sean Timmins. They played with me. That was on the pub tour after the, the grand final. I was I was standing outside the pub because I had a drink. I was on the phone or something. He came out. He goes, "Man, you here?" I said, "What?" He goes, "Bro, you didn't get picked for the for the tour." I said, what do you mean? He said, I picked the tour. You know, he said, I got picked. Wait, right, Sean Tim got in. But I didn't, you know, he didn't get in. I, I can't believe that. And I said, ah, what do you do, bro? Like, it, it crushed me, bro. It crushed me. I mean, I was going to retire then. I was going to retire then. I was thinking, what, what do I have to do? Do I have to fly for them to, to recognize, you know, my talents and what I'm doing? So... so that 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 tour the they two they do the tour, but Chris Anderson got 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 um questioned. Why didn't you wasn't what was the mundane pick? He said, Oh, we didn't pick him because of his off field characteristics. Now I don't drink, I don't smoke, I've never been um caught doing something silly in public. I don't abuse women, you know what I mean? All I all I all I did was speak up for myself and, and my beliefs. And so, you know, I think that so I think they wanted to show me the power structure. Wanted to show me that they're in they're in control, and we'll pick you when we're, when we're, when we're, when we're ready. So, so then um, I said I was going to retire that year. They they end the tour, whatever. I had an off season, you know, I went have a season at anyway. Come back, and I said, nah, all right, I'll I'll give it one more off. I'll give it one more crack of. Good off season, and then I'm, I'm gonna carve up again. I'm gonna carve them again. So then we've done that. Two thousand come, you know. I start with the start of the season two thousand. You know how they picked the Australian, Australian test, the Australian test at Anzac test in, in April. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I was killing it again. I started killing it in the first eight, eight, nine rounds in the season. My last three games. Was Newcastle, Canberra, and the Roosters. My last game was the Roosters in at Wing Stadium. I, I kill them. I kill them all three. I destroy. I beat John. I destroy Johns. I destroy Daly. We, and my team beats them. And individually, I beat them. And I destroy Fiddler. Fiddler. Fiddler they, they were in front by ten with about ten minutes ago. We scored. I scored the winning try. And then everyone. Then I was picking the the the, the, the Anzac test team. So then everyone and Daly and Fitler was out because of injury or whatever. I don't think I didn't think I wanted to play the the, the Anzac team. So I think they were out for injury. And everyone's going, fuck, this is Chop's chance, you know. Hundred percent hundred percent Monday's chance. Oh everyone thought it was Monday's go chance, hundred percent. So so did I. Well, now I've got now I've got this opportunity. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show what I can do, especially with a pack like that behind me. You know what I mean? And then, then I picked the team, the red team, and Matty Johns. He's the five eight, and this like just devastates me. And you know what? And I was like, fuck this, bro. I was fired my my bench. I said, fig this, man. I'm out. So it just devastated me for I was in the days for for a day day or two. And on the third day, I jumped on a plane and went to America. I went overseas just to get away, to get away and just to to sort of re refocus on what I want to what I want to do. You know what I mean? Because I was at that stage, I felt I had in love with the game because of what's what's been happening to me. So I went overseas, stayed for a week. I played basketball when I was fifteen. I toured the America. Um, we toured the West Coast, and and I. I was billeted out by a Filipino family and we stayed in contact. 
So I went back to see him. We spent a week with him. I played a bit of green over there while I was there, local green iron. Um, and then um, everyone, you know, the media was going crazy. Where's this bloke? And this was the time when Osama Bin Laden was big. You know what I mean? They, they had me photos with Osama Bin Laden. They had me, <laughs> they had me wow. in Hawaii. Make it, they had me making out, making out I was here, there, and everywhere. And, um, you know, and while my, my, while my teammates were in the rain training and stuff, just trying to make me a, a giggle of me, a mock of me. So then I fly, fly back in. I showed everyone at when I, I, had, I was reading the book, the, the Ali book. So I put the I put the book up. If you see the the footage, you see I put the book up as I'm leaving the, in the, the airport because I was the I thought Michael Jackson landed. There was that much media, you know what I mean? <laughs> and um, <laughs> so so then I left. So I made my mind up. I went. I went straight. And went to see. Oh, I told my dad first. I said, "Dad, um, I'm I'm quitting footy. I'm I'm going boxing." He goes, "What? What are you talking about?" He goes, "You're mad, mate. You're making seven hundred thousand dollars. Like you don't need, boxing's a hard game, mate. It's dead. Boxing's dead in this country." I said, don't, "Dad, don't worry. I bring it mouth to mouth. Don't worry." <laughs> and then uh, and then I went straight to see um Brian Johnson, who was the CEO of um the Dragon League side. And David Waite, the coach, and I told him, I told him, um, you know, I was going to retire, and you know, we we sh we should we shed a tear to each other for about five minutes, and um, it was pretty pretty sad moment, and but they knew I had to, you know, my heart wasn't in it no more, so I went to see the the board the next day. And they said, you, you, okay, you can retire, but as long as you, if you come back, you can't go to another club. You know what I mean? I said, that's no problem. And then, um, so yeah, I called my retirement and told them that um, I'd become the champion of the world. Aye, man, and that's what you did. You manifested that. And throughout your career, you were always representing your people because in year 2000, you were in the Aboriginal and Australian uh, Torres Strait Islander of the year. So you're always advocating yeah. for the better and for change. And that was unprecedented. Talk to us about it back then. No one was doing it. You were the first. Oh, yeah. I was only one, bro. I was I was the one. I was one man standard. You know what I mean? Um, I I uh, I think I played a big role into today's terms and how fashionable it is for people to support it. You know what I mean? For me, I was getting really cool left, right, and center back then. You know what I mean? Standing up for our rights. Stand standing up for for our people and our oppression and whatnot and racism and whatnot. You know, the troll gets he gets a bit of sl slag for it now, but he's got he's got a lot more support. Josh Adakar, Cody Walker, and um, all our other brothers supporting him. I had no one bro. I was one out, one out man. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was getting I was taking on the system, but I because I, I I I love Malcolm X. Malcolm X um Brother Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and what they stood for and how they fought for their people and you know justice and and um, justice and and stuff like that. So yeah. I um I sort of learned from them. You know what I mean? But I just put it on a smaller scale down down and with my people down here. Hundred percent, and it's important for the viewers and everyone watching and learning from your story to keep that energy and you know represent your people in the public eye and not to be apologetic. Because a lot of people, they want you to be, you know, part of a simulation is to have us all like robots and to do what the other guy does. And, and they don't want to take away your identity and that uniqueness. Now, what makes you the man is you told them I'm going to do this and you've done it. Not many people back themselves like that. 100%, bro. you like, got to manifest it, man. you got to believe it and first it starts in your mind. you got to, you know, then obviously implement the hard work, dedication, um, you know, uh, taking all that that hard work and that making the right choices in life and, and whatnot, you know, sacrificing a lot to to obtain what you actually want, you know. Hundred percent, and there's a lot of discomfort because you got to put yourself out there, and everyone thinks, "Oh, yeah, I can do it." Yeah, okay, show us how it's done, because you now yeah. walk away from the sport and you enter one of the hardest disciplines there is: boxing. The art of boxing. Whoever doesn't know what boxing is, go to a gym and see how long you last. 
Talk to us about that transition because it wasn't on the map prior to you. How was the nerves? Where was the confidence? And how did you know you could make it? Uh, I just knew I could fight. I just knew that I could, um, you know, because I had the bloodlines and my dad was a great fighter, one of the best Australians ever do it. I just knew I could, I could do it. And I thought from a young age, uh, I could throw him, you know what I mean? And um, I, I actually, I was young. I had one year of footy when I was about 16. And because I was just, you know, a bit, of, a bit over footy, I just wanted to try something new for a year. So I had four fights, four amateur fights. Um, but I, my dad, back in the day, Arthur Tumps was a very, very racist redneck. My dad didn't want to fight for the, the association here. So we went to the league. It's called the, the Amateur Amateur League, which is big now. But back then, it just started. And dad's mate, um, a friend of his, was doing some fights in uh, New, Cal New Caledonia, in Numea. So they took French, Francais and that. We, we, and... Um, so we we I fought four times over there that year. Went over there, you know, they paid for it, and I fought four times. I had four up, uh, and I had four wins. I was only 16, 17. I was fighting like 21, 22 year olds. You know what I mean? But I but I, I happened to win, man. I happened to win, and and alhamdulillah, I knew that I, that I had the talent to 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 go on. I wanted to come back and, and turn pro, but I was too young. I was just turned 10, 17. Had to be 18. So then I went back to footy and started ripping up in footy. Hey, champion. And look, you were, I always say it, you were ahead of your time. Now we look at the era that we're in, social media, attention, you know, marketing, you got to sell the fight, yada, yada, yada. And then you look at people like Jake Paul, Tyron Woodley, who are making million-dollar sales, even Floyd Mayweather, he fought, uh, Logan Paul. So attention sells, marketing sells. No one had their debut live on TV, pay-per-view like yourself. No matter what they're doing now, no one has done what you did. Talk to us about that because there's a lot of pressure. And uh, talk about how you channeled that, how was your nerves, and how you backed yourself. Obviously, I was a big identity, not just because of my prowess in, in rugby league and my character and what I stood for um, and what I told you we've been through with how I would speak out and take on the establishment. But because of my dad, he, he, he sort of started that name. Mundane, it's a, it's a massive name in Australia, it's sort of history. You know what I mean, and I, I just elevated that to another level. Um, just with the person that I am, you know, and the character that I am, and, and what I how I'm true to myself, and and you know, so that that really, um, that really, is you there? Yeah, it was him. yeah, sorry, bro. Um, that that really um yeah for what we're talking about what we're just talking about, about the belief and then you put yourself out there in the oh, ring yeah. your boxing debut the pressures oh, yeah, and yeah, how you yeah, dealt yeah, with it yeah I just felt because of my prowess with, on the footy field and how I built that sort of interest and and sort of um what do you call it uh very in that interest that I built from the league and the character that I was from the league, um, people wanted to see if this shit talker could back up what he's saying. You know what I mean? So I brought a lot of interest in that. So from the first get go, you know, main event as we know today, with, you know, what's with Timmy Zoo and, and I built that channel. You know what I mean? There, there was no main event, there was no nothing that I'd like left down here. You know, and um, from day dot, you know, I earned my salary of what I played footy from that one fight that night. Nah, it's look unprecedented, honestly. So you and, paid and, the way. And they knew, they knew I was the real deal, you know, when I, when I, the way I, way I performed. 100%. And look, taking a, box, a pro boxing fight is something. Building a career and world titles, multiple world titles at multiple weight classes. Talk to us about that pressure and that feeling, you know, that euphoria that you felt once you fought for a title and won a world title. Once I won the first world title against Antoine Eccles, the hard healing uh, American, um, it's like a big, big monkey off my back. No matter what I've done from that day forth, I would have lost every other fight, but I can't take the moment away from me. I told him I was a new world champ. 
I envision, envision, envision it. I you know, manifested it and make it made it become reality. You know what I mean? So that moment, I can never take away any history of, of time. So after that fight, I was just like a big weight was just lifted off my, a big much off my back. No, hundred percent. So you won the uh, WBA super middleweight, the IBO middleweight, and then you win the WBO super uh, interim super welterweight. So it's at multiple weight classes, and you won the WBA yeah. super middleweight twice. And, I, and I'm going, and, I, and I'm going down in weight. Normally, uh, fighters go up in weight. And I'm going down because my my body was starting to. It took about 10, 12 years for my body to really adapt to that boxing physique, and. And my, my, if I would have stayed in boxing from a young age, I reckon I would have been a middleweight. It would have been my perfect weight. But um, I went down a super welterweight. I fought one of the best fighters in the history of, of game and beat him, um, Shane Mosley. And you want to stop him as well, man. He's never been yeah. stopped. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to stop him. So, alhamdulillah, bro. Uh, I can't. God, God, get, God give me everything, man. Alhamdulillah, you know. Just bless, bless me in so many ways. But, you know, people that this average person out there, you know, our blessings are beyond belief because, you know, the food, the air, the oxygen, the freaking, um, the comfort that we live in, the life we live down in Australia is, you know, unbelievable. 100%. And for the viewers taking from your story, right, a lot of people just believe that you were born and you achieved it and there was no sacrifices, there was no struggles, there was no doubt, you know, because a lot of people feel that and they drop off. There's a difference when you continuously strive and there's levels to it. And that's why we need the people to take from your story and pave their own path, mm. taking on those struggles. You just got to, if you want something and you're, you're, you're obsessed in being what you want to obtain, you have to make them sacrifice in order to achieve it. You know what I mean? Um, but you have to be obsessed in, in what you, you're wanting to achieve before you achieve it. No, 100%, man, because talent only gets you some way. The rest is perseverance, desire, sacrifice, discipline. Yeah, 100%, bro, 100%. Like, who would have thought, like, everyone thought I was, you know, especially with the black community, the Aboriginal community, they thought I was, I had a spoon, I was spoon-fed. My dad was, my, my dad, my dad wouldn't like me saying this, but he wasn't the best with money. Black fathers ain't the best with money. You know what I mean? They blow it, blow it. They just spend it. So by any, by the time he finished, um, he didn't have my, he didn't have nothing but one house, and then we then we had to sell that. So we had nothing. You know what I mean? We just a, a family that you know, was doing our best. You know what I mean? Then by the time I was eighteen, nineteen, I had to I had to be the breadwinner for the for the family. You know what I mean? So. But alhamdulillah, man, everything's good. I bought my mom, I bought my mum a house. I bought my my kids' house. Um, my sister was living in one of my houses. But alhamdulillah, I've been, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, I wouldn't have thought I was going to make 30, 35 million in my career. But alhamdulillah, I love the king, bro, you know. But, God bless you, man. God gives those who gives, man. And when you have a pure intention and you work towards your goal, everything's possible. You know, the world's your oyster, as they say. So talk to us about 100%, bro. 100%. talk to us about your rivalries, your Daniel Gills, your Danny Greens. What did they do for your career in boxing? Were they personal? Were they as they were painted? From your perspective, how was that? And how did that you know define the storyline in your career? Um. Well, first is Danny Daniel Gill for Gill fighter. He was um. It wasn't so much personal for me, but. He was like a token. He was making out he was black. You know what I mean, and I know, I know, because black black fellas, black mob, like Lebanese fellas, they know they know family and from you to say your tribe you're from or where you where your mob, where your people, we know who they are. You know what I mean? He couldn't. He didn't, he didn't know where his mob was. You know I mean, so I was calling him out on saying um, that he was he was he was. Um, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't Aboriginal. He wasn't black. He was just one of them Johnny Come Lately. You know what I mean? And I know. I heard from a good sources that he ain't. You know what I mean? So I just put that out there. And that's that. I started the, the rivalry. But that was that was that was, a, that was the second fight where I fought him. 
But the first fight, he was just a young. Sorry, bro. No, no, it's all good, man. My daughter, my daughter's trying to call me. <laughs> he was just a young, young cat that um, oh, she's trying to call me. She, she wants um, she wants food. <laughs> he, he was just a, he was just a young cat that um, oh, this girl. So, yeah, guys, just for the people listening, he's talking about Daniel Gill and how it happened in the second fight. He was just a hungry cat. Yeah, tell us, Tron. No, so he was a, a young um, young cat that coming through and everyone had big high hopes for him, that, uh, raving about him. And they asked, will I fight him? Um, I said, yeah, I'll fight him. You know what I mean? And, you know, for his, for his middleweight title, IBA title. So this was in Brisbane. And you know, was, he, they, they, him and their team was very, very confident. And but I was cocking gat, I was confident too. You know what I mean? Yeah, he couldn't beat me. But that was that was probably one of the best fights to to witness. It was very appealing to the public. You know what I mean? It was back and forth action. It was a very close fight, but I, I still believe I won it, which I did. And you know, I, I landed the cleaner and crisp shots, and and humbly I got the victory. And won another world title as well under me, me, me strap, which was the IBO uh, middleweight championship as well. God bless you, man. I'll never forget all youngsters when that fight happened. I was still probably, what, 14. And uh, me and my mate, we went to Alexandria. You know where they play basketball? But on the side in the indoor centre, yeah. there's a bit of a boxing ring. They were doing the promo for Gil. Gil was there. And my mate, he won't like me saying his name, but uh, he's a big yeah. fan of you. Jeez, he's the type of guy i got to calm him down when we're somewhere and tell him, bro, relax. We don't want to get into too much trouble. He's going back and forth with Daniel Gill, <laughs> telling him, Chock's going to get you. He's got your number. You don't deserve to be in the ring with him, yada, yada, yada. Saying everything you said is repeating it, you know? And who ripped him to shreds was Daniel Gill's wife, bro. She was something special. Him and his team, well, you got to remember, we're two kids. They're ripping us into shreds. And I'm like, bro, relax. You know, then they started calling security and stuff. And I got us out of there. But uh, it's just a funny, funny instance. And you know, stories like that, you never forget people that, you know, pushed you off and told you, get out of here. <laughs> but it was definitely worth it. So uh, we've got Chuck on the line. His uh, daughter's been calling, so I'm assuming that he's just taken on the call. And we're just relaying and talking about, you know, the career that he has had. He has had many rivalries. We're talking about the Daniel Gill. We're going to move on to the Danny Green one as soon as we regain Anthony, who's currently on the phone. And... Um, Okay, so we've currently lost him temporarily. Um, Anthony, the man, Mundine, is temporarily uh, offline. Uh, let me see something. So, yeah, just a bit of technical difficulties. We've got the man back. And now we're just going to talk about the rivalry you had with the Green Machine. Now, talk... Uh, Transcend boxing in Australia, the world were talking about that. Talk to us about how it was on you and how it felt to be a part of that. Yeah, it was, uh, I knew it was, it was building to be a, how can I say, a, 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 a race war. You know what I mean? He had like white Australia, white Australia with him. You know what I mean? Obviously, I'm a black fellow, I'm Aboriginal, so I had black Australia with me. And not not just black Australian, but white fellas that knew, you know, that that advocated for Aboriginal plight and Aboriginal change. You know what I mean? So I had a lot of white supporters too, not just not just black. But um he had the system basically, you know what I mean? So that's why that fight was so big. The biggest I think I think the biggest per per capita in the world ever. Um, sold it. Talk about stadium shows. You guys were the first. Like, I mean, the list goes on with the first that you guys were doing. And that build up made, you know, you sold out a stadium and geez, it's still spoken about till today. And the performance you put on with all that pressure, only the man can do that. Yeah, well, you, the, your preparation is the key to, to your performance. You know what I mean? I got in the, at that time, I, I, um, connected with uh, Roy Jones Sr., who uh, everyone knows, Roy Jones Jr.'s dad, who taught him everything he knew and, you know, made one of the best pound-for-pound fighters of all time in Roy, Roy Jr. So, you know, 
I went to um to Pensacola um before before that preparation. Um you know, got, honed up my skills over there for about a month or so. Then I came back here. <clears throat> then I, I brought Roy Roy and his team out about a month before the fight. So I could really be sharpened up and really be be ready to um, to put on a performance like I did. Jeez, and the performance it was. Talk was that one of your most impressive performances from yourself, from your perspective, considering the pressure and the build up and everything that came with that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Considering with the magnitude of the fight, considering the magnitude of the pressure, and and everything that comes with that, um, you know, um, pressure and, and limelight, um, and the build up of the fight. You know, this is like you're not just fighting for yourself. You know what I mean? You're fighting for your people, and you're fighting for your mob that <clears throat> that's been oppressed and and trodden on for so many years, and you're fighting a system that's very a racist, barbaric sort of systemic sort of system. It seems like throughout your whole career, it's something that you, you took upon yourself to represent. You know, you kept that same energy. You know, you were performing at highest of levels. You had all the attention on you. Yet you didn't shy away from it. A lot of people, you know, they put on a second persona. It's like on camera, they're one person. Off camera, they're, up, they're not. Different guy. You've kind of said, you know what? This is the man. This is Chalk. I'm doing it my way. And, you know... All aboard. Yeah, man, I just, <clears throat> you know, to be honest, like, away from the limelight, away from the sort of T lights, camera, action stuff, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really shy. People that know me know that I'm pretty shy and really down to earth type of cat, you know what I mean? But when, uh, when you have to stand up and say certain things and do certain things, I'd be a, my alter ego kicks into play. You know, the man sort of comes out and, and um, you know, sometimes, you know, when I'm in the street and people notice me oh, and they, they get they get flustered because they think, because the way I'm portrayed, well, I'm this sort of, sort of, I'm sort of reachable sort of cat or, you know, I'm sort of, you know, no one can approach me or whatever, but. I'm totally opposite from that, yeah. Yeah, that, look, it resonates with your your line of work. So you got your institutions, you got the Mundine Promotions where you're uh, helping out to upskill people that need work in the construction in the industry. Uh, you also yeah, coach MGM, MGM. MGM, that's it. You also coach yeah. and you give a lot of a lot back in rugby league. And for me, a lot of people don't see that side of you as well, like you're saying, because you're shy and you're reserved. And the good you do, you don't come out and say you did that, unlike others. So you don't do it for the PR. Yeah, nah, so you got to do it from the heart, man. It's not real, it's, you know. It's not authentic, you know what I mean? Like, you got to keep it real. And I've always been a, a cat that keeps it real and, um, you know, from the heart, you know what I mean? I, I really, I'm a big believer in do good, you get good. Now, Allah will continue to bless you, you know what I mean? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, inshallah, I'll continue to do the works and, you know, have his blessings. 100%. And, you know, you are an entrepreneur, you are unique. So you have that platform and ability to reach more people, you know, and God, like you said, gives those who give. So God bless you, Chuck and Anthony, you know. Yeah. It's been a pleasure having you. But before we let you go, you went on a reality TV show that you made me watch. <laughs> what was it? Get me out of here, the jungle <laughs> celebrity. Talk to oh, us yeah, about that, man. Uh, you know, and, the, and yeah, you man. were there with Danny as well. So talk to us about all that. Yeah, well, actually, Danny Green's team, or his team contacted my team, and said, would you guys do, like to go on a, um, a TV show? He goes, I've been, I've been um, invited to go on, but I think it'll be a lot more bigger and better, and they do too, if we both go on together. And I was like, what is it? <laughs> I mean, and they said, the celebrity, get me out of here. I, I never really watched the show before, so I, I checked it out a little bit. I said, wow, that'll be pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, I wouldn't, yeah, I'd have a go because you have to fly to South Africa and, you know, um, in the jungle 
<laughs> so I said, yeah, I'll be up for that adventure. I've been, I've been a lot more adventurous, adventurous in, the, in the later part of my life. So I said, why not? Let's do it. So then we got the contracts done and um, I was headed to South Africa. <laughs> uh, it's crazy because I don't usually watch these things. And then when I saw you on the commercial, I'm like, I've got to give it a go. And it was yeah. hilarious, man. I, I, it was <laughs> an experience. It, wrap it up in a couple of words. How did you feel coming out of that? You're like, did I actually really do it? Yeah, I was pretty, pretty crazy with what I like the stunt, the things I put down my throat. Um, I mean, going into to the bed, a bed of snakes or hundreds of snakes, like I wouldn't do that. Uh, you know, uh, if you see, uh, if you if you've seen the clip, I was I was doing a fasty heart like throughout when I was in the friggin' in the in the little swamp with the snakes. I was just doing a fasty heart and just praying a lot, like. Keep them, um, keep them cool, you know. Yeah, that was crazy, bro. I remember watching. I'll never forget, man. And they're putting them all on your slime, bro. Credit to you, man. I couldn't get out of the jungle, let alone do that. You know, it was good <laughs> stuff, man. No, <laughs> no, nah, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was unbelievable experience, unbelievable memories that I have for life. And I did it for my, uh, I had kids around uh, 10, 11, 12 years old. So I did it for them too, to, to, because they reckon it's like a, uh, I saw a youthful show, so they would um, they would have liked it. No, nah, that's good, bro. God bless you. Talk to us a bit about parenthood. So you've done what you've done. Now, as a parent, you know, for any other parents watching or any other people aspiring to be parents, what is the role now you got to do to give back and to provide for the next generations to come? Yes, you just got to you sort of guide them in the right direction, man. Guide, guide, guide them in the right direction. Take a lot of. Um, a lot of you know, the knowledge of, of Islam and, you know, because that's, that's the, the gold sort of standards of, of how you should be, especially the Prophet Muhammad, that's in peace be upon him now. So you try to guide them as best you can be, you know, with their manners, with their uh, thoughtfulness, um, with everything, every facet of life. And um, alhamdulillah, I'm doing that. Uh, alhamdulillah as well. You know, the mundane name, inshallah, will live on. You know, we got watch their space as well. Now, who knows? We might have them on the podcast. You know, the basketball world, the footy world. You know, talk to us about that. As yeah. a dad, is it more nerve-wracking watching yeah, or playing or when you were playing? Um, I don't know, man. Especially the footy. But, so, or, or both, really. Um, it's sort of, I know what they're capable of. You know what I mean? And when, if I don't think they're putting it up, putting in the effort that sort of pisses me off you know, I don't want to go watch I'm not going to put in the effort and put in the to, 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 to dare to be great or try to be to be the best you can be then I don't, what am I doing you're wasting my time you know what I mean so I tell them like you know I don't care if you I don't care if you play a bad game all I want is effort 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 and do the things that you know that I try to teach you to do both in Basketball, band, football. So I know both them sports. Yeah. No, it's honestly very important, Anthony, brother. It's been a pleasure. You know, for everyone watching, you will take the lessons, the sacrifice, the drive, the determination. You know, and like you said, the effort, the one percenters. That's what differentiates yeah. good from great. You know, yeah. ordinary to extraordinary. You know, to perform yeah. under the lights and when push comes to shove, and in these high pressure moments, you need to put back. You know, it's like muscle memory. Every, all the work that you put in, all the years of sacrifice, it pays pays to fruition, you know? Sometimes life, 100%. You know, sometimes, you know, things don't make sense. But in 2020, you understand that it's character building, you know what I mean? That's what this platform's I mean, for. We get people on to say their story, give it as it is, unfiltered, you know what I mean? And we, we'll yeah. put it back to our last message for all the people watching worldwide. Um, what I want to say is just... <clears throat> um. Make the right choices in life. You know what I mean? Make the right choices in life. If you, you know, have a talent or you want to do something, you have to, like I said, you have to become obsessed with that goal, with that, with that destination and implement the works in order to get to that des destination. Um, nine times out of 10, you'll, you'll do it if you implement the way, the mindset and the, the structure that I've sort of built my career on. You know what I mean? And my success is what I've achieved in my career. You know what I mean? If I didn't have that mindset, if I didn't have that right um, 
choices and determination, dedication, discipline, um, all them things, um, and vision. You have to visualize it, man. You got to believe it. You know what I mean? And, and continue to work. You know, like I said, become obsessed with that goal and that, that dream. Nine times out of ten, you're going to get it. Just, just, just be patient and continue to work and believe. 100%. It's been a pleasure. Honestly, bucket list. My favourite athlete growing up. The best athlete Australia's ever seen. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast, Anthony. We're out.